live from Houston, Texas, it's The Cube, covering Grace Hopper's celebration of women in computing. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Grace Hopper Conference here in Houston, Texas. I'm joined with, I'm Rebecca Knight, your host, and I'm joined by Tori Bedford, who is one of our tech reporting fellows. We're also joined by Andrea Limbago, the chief social scientist at Endgame, which is a cybersecurity company based in Washington, D.C. Take it away, Tori. So welcome, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really just so excited to hear what you have to say about cybersecurity, but let's start with your role at Endgame and some of the work that you're doing there. Sure, right, right. We're a cybersecurity company, um, still probably at the, at the start of this phase, and so we all wear a lot of different hats uh, within the company. So part of my job is I run our technical blog, working a lot with our malware researchers, vulnerability uh, prevention uh, researchers, data scientists, and so forth, uh, and really trying to put out a lot of really good technical content that's useful for uh, a variety of folks. And then at the same time, I also do a lot of research on the geopolitical aspect of cybersecurity. And so, um, obviously there's a lot going on in that area right now, and that's a lot of where my research comes into play. So, that's what you're talking about at, at the conference. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? You're, you're focusing on national cybersecurity, and you're kind of taking a more offensive approach. Well, not offensive, but you're on the offense, <laughs> yeah. dealing with um, offense. Right, well actually more of a proactive approach, and so part of my, my talk is to basically highlight just how far policy has lagged behind in technology. So, while technology obviously has been going at a you know, exponentially rapid pace for innovation and change, policy has not. And so a lot of the policy right now still guiding cybersecurity and a lot of security and privacy issues are from the Cold War. So some of the frameworks from the Cold War and the policy itself is from about 30 years ago. And so we really need policy to leapfrog and advance to where we are today with the, with the actual threat landscape, with the technological landscape, and to be more in tune with that. And so my talk it's basically taking more of a proactive approach. I'll talk a little bit about the evolution of how we've been thinking about offense in the cyber realm, and then how we can use sort of the, the, the offensive mentality for, for strengthening our defenses, but then also helping inform um, deterrence, both in the policy realm and through technology as well. Okay, I feel like that word mm -hmm. offense is kind of a, we're seeing it as kind of a dirty word. Yes. I mean, we're afraid that we're going to go to war with Russia and it's going to be the next World War III. Right. Um, right. And is then, that a concern? Um, there is a concern on that, absolutely, and so part of, Absent any government discussion and more government policy right now, where there's a big discussion, largely something in a lot of the private sector for more offensive capabilities. And so a lot of people are throwing out something like the letters of mark, which basically is uh, documents that legalizing companies to actually go and, and get their data back. And it's based on something from the 1300s. Um, there also are uh, discussions of hacking back, which is basically going into another external network to either try and take back your, your data or to retaliate. And so I think that is very, very concerning that, that that's where some of the discourse is going, and so we need the government to step in a bit more and actually provide the, the parameters for what is, what is acceptable and what is not, but it has to match the, the current, both the current threat landscape and the, the current technological landscape. And so at the same time, we can be more proactive. <laughs> and so there is going to be a fine line. You don't want to go into the escalatory area because cyber it does become linked with all the other aspects of, of geopolitics but we can't also just sit back and do nothing. Just within the last few days, I think we've seen some really interesting developments. U.S. officials are now saying that they believe that Russia is feeding information about the emails that right. to WikiLeaks. Um, right. Where are we now? How, are, we? are they developing a plan? Are, are, you, <laughs> you know, are um, you seeing more progress with that? I'll say, well, yeah, obviously I'm not privy to some of those conversations, although I would love to be, but even just right before this, uh, a Russian hacker was just arrested in the Czech Republic, and so, um, I think we're going. What, I think that, along with the Julian Assange, uh, with what Ecuador is doing there, um, I think that's the start of the the proportional response that that President Obama talked about uh, in response to attributing the the Russian hacks, the, the election hacks, to Russia. But there's only been, a few, I think, three other times in recent times where the U.S. has actually publicly attributed an attack. And so the other one, the five PLA officers, a couple of years ago. Um, earlier this year, there were seven Iranian. Uh, hackers that were indicted. And that was for some of the bank and crimeware that, um, that they did. And uh, then after Sony, of course, with the North Korean sanctions. And so we're in an exploratory phase, I would say, as far as creating that deterrent policy, because deterrence can happen. Basically, deterrence is preventing someone from doing something that they otherwise might do. And that's more from the international relations aspect of it. And so it can happen by punishment or denial. And part of what I'll, I'll be talking about is that through punishment is where the policy aspect can come in. And that's really looking across the statecraft tools any economic sanctions, indictments, um, freezing assets, uh, information campaigns, those kind of things. 
and the technology needs to step it up as well and do and help deter deterrence by a denial and having better denying those hackers even to have access into the networks as well, which will never 100% prevent that, but we need to do better than what we're doing right now. So you're essentially saying we give an ultimatum. We say, if you do this, we will do this. I think, this we, need, I think, yeah, I think we need to need make that clear. So that's a declaratory policy that needs to be done. And on the one hand, you need more the flexibility, and that's the, that's the, the key thing, honestly, for, for geopolitics, though, is having some flexibility in there. And so you need to make clear what the range of options are that are available. If we see our critical infrastructure attacked, here are the range of options of how we're probably, that we, what we're going to consider responding. And so we need to have some of the, that, it's not necessarily a red line, as, as we've seen, red lines haven't been working over the, over the last few years, because especially if you don't follow up on them. Um, but we need to make it much more clear that we're not going to sit back and do nothing. And that, if that more or less has been what's been going on for decades, the, the first time the US government attributed one of a major uh, breach was back in 96. And so we, nothing has changed. You mentioned our infrastructure. I understand we have kind of a, a complicated protection of our infrastructure. Right. Certain things are pretty well protected. Other things are very right. weak. Um, I want to talk about our, our electoral system. Okay. That's a huge concern. That's what's is. coming up now. How susceptible are we to an attack of our voting machines or our right. electoral process? Right. I think. I think some of the fear mongering is, is worse than what the actual um, risk is because, you know, thanks to the federalism, you know, all the different electoral systems are using different technologies and run in very different ways. And so, and we also have, you know, more on the policy side, there are a lot of people actually standing guard on watching over those. So, I think it's rightful to be concerned. It absolutely, and we need to be aware of it, and we absolutely need to strengthen our um, strengthen our defenses around the electoral process and then, and then the system itself. But at the same time. A lot of the, discuss, the discussion that's going on right now is really you know, it's overblowing it so far as far as you know, voter fraud and those kind of things. I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty well, uh, not necessarily secure, but it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's followed closely to make sure everything is working the way it's supposed to. If you look at the data, I mean, voter fraud really is, is not very common. Then you hear, the, you, know, you hear it being talked about like it's happening every day. And it's just, it's not that terribly common. And so I think we should be concerned like, about it as we should be about every part of it, critical infrastructure. Um, but I, I think that might be one of our, you know, not necessarily the least of the worries, but not necessarily as worrisome so as some other aspects. we shouldn't freak out that Russian hackers are going to take I think we need to be, the election. I think we need to be worried about it, but I also think that we're on top of it. Okay. I wanted to talk to you about hackers. Yep. You've written about hackers and how, uh, kind of the bad rap that they right. get. Um, I wanted to talk to you about what you think we should do to yeah. improve the relationship between yep our cybersecurity right. companies and our governmental efforts and right. hackers in general. Right, no, I absolutely, I, mean, I actually wish that the term hacker could go back to its you know, original connotation, which actually was quite positive. You know, it's basically you know, exploring new ways to do things, you know, breaking things and fixing them. Um, that was really part of the original aspect of what being a hacker was. And then again, you know, throughout, really in the 80s, they started to change a little bit towards more of a negative connotation. And that was still when people were exploring things, you're looking to, you know, almost you, know, you, sneak, you know, find ways to get in, and then actually a lot of that helping build that defense. Um, but it does have a terrible connotation, especially if you look in the media in Hollywood. And so, you know, Mr. Robot, it's a great show, but I don't work with anyone that's like Mr. Robot. You know, the, the, the people I work with are, you know, really smart and they go everywhere. You know, they, they range from some, you know, self-taught experts to PhDs in a, in a variety of disciplines, but they're all working together. And I think that's the, the great thing about security uh, and that it regards that the disciplinary backgrounds can come together um, and educational backgrounds and those kind of things can work really, really well together in security, but that's never portrayed. And I, I think if uh, media and in Hollywood and so forth could actually show a little bit of the diversity, and granted, your security is by no means <laughs> a diverse field. I mean, there's like eight to 10% women, uh, so obviously there's a problem, but we need to have, get other, you know, other industries on board for actually how they portray hackers and you're assuming if, as long, if we continue the perspective of all hackers as you know, socially inept, you know, men living in a basement, and that does not, does not, or the 400 pound hacker, right? and that, that does nothing to progress our field at all. Uh, we have a lot of really innovative, smart people who are working out to you know, try and find that balance between security and privacy for everyone. In terms of progressing the field, I mean, we're here at Grace Hopper yeah. with all these incredible women. I understand yeah. that Endgame has done a lot to yeah. um, make it a more in inviting environment for women, make the workplace, you know, retain women, right. advance women. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, and I'll say, you know, you know, similar to, I think, what was talked about the keynotes earlier, we by no means have solved it, um, but there's a lot that can be done, and that's, you know, there's tons of social science research. Actually, you can help every single organization if they only implemented some of it. And so it's anything from 
you know, giving out swag that is in women's sizing. You know, we didn't used to do that. And so, you know, I had a bunch of really big t-shirts. Like, very little things like that have a big role in, you know, in in-group, out-group dynamics. And so the more we can make women feel like they're part of the team and integrate them, the better. And so doing things like that, um, our social activities, ensuring that those are more inclusive to both, you know, across gender, but you know, throughout demographics um, as well. And so anything, we would do book discussions, play soccer. Um, and recruiting changed as well. And recruiting as well. And so a lot of the studies show that the way that you actually write up your job uh, recommendations, if you list, list 50 requirements, a lot of women that are going to get turned off by that. Because for women, they'll go through the list. If they can't do 100% of them, they're not going to apply. For men, it's like, I can do two. And so I'm not even, women need to change that mindset. But until we get there, we need to make the, the job descriptions much more approachable. And so still keeping the bar high, but just not listing 100 different languages that you may or may not need to know uh, for that specific position. And then also using language that isn't, um, you target at an 18-year-old boy. And that's, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of that stuff out there as far as, you know, are you a coding ninja or are you a cyber warrior? And those, those kind of terms are, are offsetting to women. There and so, could be female ninjas and warriors too. There can, no, absolutely. And that's, um, but if you want to make it more inclusive, and then a lot of guys will, be, will say that they're not a ninja, right? And so it's just making sure you're, you're using terminology that will appeal to as broad a segment as possible. And that's why, like, even with the social activities, like, well, people that you know, maybe don't like sports, so they're, they're not going to play soccer, and that's fine. And so, it's very hard to appeal to everybody, but if you have enough that, cross, that cuts across, so there are aspects of the company uh, and the team building and those kind of things that appeal to you know, the various groups, I, I think that's, that's the key goal. Um, what do you think that women are looking for in a, in a workplace? Uh, ah, that's a good question. Um, flexibility, and that's actually what was highlighted today for the top business. Flexibility is key, and that's not just, uh, you know, that, that, that always gets associated with you know, working moms. And it's not just working moms. You know, uh, women just out of college, they want flexibility. Women, you know, at, perhaps at the stage of raising a family, they want flexibility. Women, further along in their career, need flexibility. I mean, men and, want and flexibility. That's, that's, that's <laughs> about to say that. And so do men. Yeah. I mean, we just had, I think, over a dozen. We were, we're about 130 people. We had about a dozen babies this year at Endgame. And most were, you know, most of the were that were dads. That they want that flexibility. It's not just a, a women's issue. And so, when you, so I think the flexibility aspect. I think um, being able to, you know, master their skills professional development, and that's another aspect I should add you know, at Endgame that we're doing as far as professional development. Um, we help get, you know, I get to speak here partly through our, you know, our program that we have that um, encourages us to submit abstracts, get out there on the circuit, and so forth. And so professional development absolutely is a, is a key aspect, and you know, there's a Harvard Business Review study of why women leave engineering, and one of the big reasons was it wasn't family, it wasn't kids, it was because there was no career advancement. Mm -hmm. and so ensuring there's that career advancement, there's the opportunities to advance professionally, um, I think that has a lot to say. And then just you know, autonomy is another big aspect. You have to work obviously with the team, but also being able to work on your own as well. Um, and, and again, gain, which links back to the mastery and so forth. So I think be at those. But then obviously, um, you know, there are some workplaces that are more toxic than others, and so obviously you want to be uh, you're avoiding some of those. But you know, inclusion, inclusion. I, would, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. No, thank you. That was a great interview where you weighed in on everything from what women want in the workplace <laughs> to voter fraud to Russia to finding the yeah. balance between security and privacy. That's great. Great. All right. Thank you so All much, right. Tori, so for much. that great report. And thank you for joining us too. This has been the coverage of theCUBE's coverage of Grace Hopper Conference here in Houston, Texas. We'll be back soon just after the break. <laughs>